And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers for this evening. First up is Caleb Miller. And Caleb is the co-owner of JCM Timberworks along with his brother and the current president of Friends of Ohio Barns. He was born and raised in Holmes County, Ohio and operates JCM Timberworks uh, out of Holmes County. He started out his professional career as a paratrooper with the US Army and he's a combat veteran. After success in mechanical and metal fabrication trades, he returned to his roots of woodworking where he found a home in traditional timber framing. His early occupational skills laid the groundwork for falling into the niche of timber framed barn preservation and repair. Caleb holds a bachelor's in psychology and has extensive graduate studies from UNC in psychology as well. So we're happy to have Caleb joining us tonight. We also have with us Rudy Christian. Rudy is a founding member and past president of the Timber Framers Guild and Friends of Ohio Barns, a founding member and past executive director of the Preservations Trades Network, and a founding member of the Traditional Timber Frame Research and Advisory Group and the International Trades as Education Initiative. His experience includes national and international speaking engagements and instructing educational workshops, as well as pu the publication of various articles about historic conservation. Rudy has studied structural engineering at both General Motors Institute and Akron University in Ohio and historic compound roof layout and computer modeling in Germany. He and his wife, Laura Saker, are adjunct, were adjunct professors at Palomar College in San Marcos, California, and are approved workshop instructors for the Timber Framers Guild. Rudy's professional experience as president of Christian and Son Incorporated includes the reconstruction of the historic Big Barn at Malabar State Farm, or excuse me, at Malabar Farm State Park near Mansfield, Ohio, and the relocation of the 19th century Crawford Horse Barn in Newark, Ohio. He also led a crew of timber framers at the Smithsonian Folk Like Festival in the recreation and raising of an 18th century carriage house frame on the mall in Washington, DC. Christian and Son's work includes uh, many highlights, uh, including the relocation of Thomas Edison's number 11 laboratory building from the Henry Ford Museum and the restoration of the Mansfield Blockhouse, a hewn log, hewn log structure built by the US military in 1812. Since May of 2015, Rudy and Laura have been working as consultants to the World Monuments Fund in the restoration of the Golden Palace Monastery in Mandalay, Myanmar. So we are so pleased to have with us this evening, Caleb and Rudy. Please gentlemen, take it away. Thank you. Good evening. I hope everybody can hear me all right. Sarah, how's my volume? Good. Um, thank you very much for attending this first um, educational presentation of Friends of Ohio Barnes. Uh, it's an undertaking that we wish we didn't have to plan for, but uh, we're glad we have the opportunity to share with all of you. And um, we're gonna talk this evening about um, a pretty special project uh, that Caleb and I have been involved in um, because it, it really strikes close to my heart and I know it does to Caleb's too, um, about the reason that we should be doing something to preserve our historic barns. Um, one of the things about historic barns that uh, I think is pretty much, uh, excuse me while I try and get my forward here to work. There we go. Um, is that um, they're an example of um, the conservation of historic structures. Um, and, and what you see on screen right now is my explanation of the various facets of conservation. And you're probably a little confused by why I'm using the word conservation. But in fact, in our travels around the world and my studies uh, with various people from different countries, conservation is actually the term that is used for keeping structures useful for taking care of historic buildings. In this country, we use the word preservation first, but preservation is actually a subcategory of conservation. And if you read through the ones that I've shown here on the screen, these are just some of the different categories that are involved in the conservation of historic structures. The truth is that very few people really ever think about these things. Um, and part of the reason for that is that conservation is a new uh, idea in the United States. We just passed the Historic Preservation Act in 1966. So the idea of taking care of historic buildings um, really didn't even come to people's minds before that and really still doesn't in a lot of cases. So these things that you're looking at right now are what I consider to be um, the artifact oriented way of looking at keeping structurals useful. 
We look at whether we're gonna preserve them because maybe George Washington slept there or whatever, and we don't do anything to it, or we're gonna restore them to what it was like when George Washington slept there, or we're gonna find out that George Washington actually didn't even sleep there, and we're just gonna do something to fix the building up and continue to make it useful. But those things are all artifact oriented. They're talking about the building. But stewardship, on the other hand, is the human aspect of it. It's the people part of it. It's the idea that none of those ideas, none of those philosophies would even work if people weren't involved. And where it really becomes important to understand what stewardship is, is stewardship is when the owner of the building takes an interest in doing something about making sure that it continues to exist on into the future. Um, it isn't about whether a professional architect or a professional engineer um, or a city council or anyone else said, yes, we should make sure to take care of this. It's about the owner of the building and how they feel about their building. So in the case of a historic barn, they have a choice. Can they just do the least amount possible to keep it useful, to keep it functioning, to keep it from just falling down? Or can they do something a little more realizing the importance of what they own and what they owe to it and the history. Because in truth, if you own a historic barn, you're only the caretaker of it at the moment. The historic barn has lived long before you and hopefully with your help and people who know how to take care of them, it will live well beyond you and it will become someone else's responsibility. This particular barn we're talking about is a pre-Civil War barn, and it's owned by Lorian David Sondlin. Um, interestingly enough, um, the barn actually um, was owned by part of Lori's family um, as far back as it can be traced in history, probably to when it was built. Um, and Lori and David, when the barn was being worked on, found a board early on when it was being uh, restored the last time, found a board that they think had the name of the builder on it. And they tried to find that when we were preparing for this presentation, but unfortunately, somehow it's been misplaced. They, they actually even cut a hole in the barn, I mean, in the uh, garage wall where they thought it might have been hiding behind a new wall that was at it. And it turned out it wasn't there either. Um, but the name that was on that board that in their memory was Reuben Snyder. And when Lori traced back the family history, what she found was that the family history showed that there was no one named Reuben Steiner, Snyder who existed in the family history back um, to Laura, Lori's great grandmother's age. But when I came in and looked at the barn originally with Laura, um, who my wife and I worked together um, two years ago, um, we realized that this barn obviously was built before the Civil War. It was built sometime in the early 19th century. And when Lori realized that that's what the age of the barn probably was, she started to research the history of it a little more. And she found that um, Reuben Snyder's name actually existed in the birth records. And he was the brother of Lori's grandmother's great, great, no, great grandfather. And his name actually exists in the family history. So it's pretty likely that this barn was built by Reuben Snyder. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that the picture you're looking at right now is one of three barns. It's not the barn we're talking about tonight, but it's one of three barns that were built by adjoining family farms. And the chances that Reuben Snyder built them all is pretty good. This barn, unfortunately, is gone. So we have not had a chance to look at it. But this is the inside of the barn that we're talking about. It's the barn that Lori and David have had us working on. Um, Caleb and our company have collaborated on working this barn to make sure that uh, our talents are used in the best way possible to, to keep it alive for as long as it can be. But it's a very interesting barn. If you look up at the corner here where the, this is called a tie beam and where it joins this plate, which is on top of the main post of the bent, you'll notice the tie beam actually goes through the post to the other side. And this neck down joint is something that um, I was interested in. 
and I wanted to find out more about if there's any history to it. So I actually took it to the uh, Traditional Timber Framers Research and Advisory Group, pretty long name, um, but that's part of the Timber Framers Guild and it's the people that really focus on old buildings. And what I found is that um, it wasn't as uncommon as I thought, but it has an interesting heritage. Um, Ian Stewart, who is a specialist on Dutch construction, found a similar joint in a barn in um, in in, uh, in Netherlands. and that joint was called a kabalkabint. I'm sure I butchered that, um, which also means cup beam assembly. So. It definitely is a barn that has a, or a frame type and a joint type that has existed well back before the settling of America. Uh, Jack Sobin also in his book, Historic American Joinery, has an example of it, and he calls it a necked down tie joint. So this, this particular tie joint, which is not terribly common in this part of the world at all, exists in this barn, and it exists in the third barn that was built on the series of uh, farms that are part of the Snyder family history. Um, when we started looking at it, and this was before I, I brought um, Caleb and his brother John and their people together to help us work on it, I realized that this barn had had things done to it in the past. Um, the picture you're looking at is looking up at the main floor of the barn from underneath. And if you notice, there are floorboards there that obviously have been taken up and put back down again. What you're seeing here is called whitewash. It's actually a lime paint and it was used to sterilize barns in order for them to be classified as class A dairies. You look at the floor joist, it also has whitewash on it. But if you look on the right, this floor joist not only doesn't have whitewash, but it also is not hand hewn like this one is. This one is sawn on a circular sawmill. So it's a replacement. And these floorboards obviously were taken up and put back down again. So we realized early on in the work on this barn that we were gonna to have to pay attention to what was old and what wasn't so old, what was maybe modifications or changes that were made in order for us to be able to do the proper work. Um, what David and Lori had asked us to do was to come in and um, restore the barn not just keep it going by spending as little money as possible. They wanted us to try and do our best job possible to take it back to what it was in the past. If you remember reading those uh, terms in the first part of it, restoration is taking a barn back to a certain period. So rather than try and go back all the way to when this barn was built, probably in the 1820s, maybe the 18, no, probably the 1830s to 1840s, uh, we decided to take it back to sometime in the early 20th century because many changes had been made to the foundation. You can see here, these bricks on the left-hand side of the screen are actually paving bricks. They're made by a company called Worcester Paver. The Worcester Paver Company didn't even come into existence until 1892. So we know those are not part of the original foundation. And if you look over here, you see what are um, glazed tiles. They're actually, uh, let's see. Pardon, Laura? Vitreous. Tiles. Vitreous, glazed vitreous tiles. Well, that's something that didn't come out until just before World War I. So these are not part of the original construction, which means, and of course you look right up here, you see here's another beam that isn't hand hewn, circular sawn, post-Civil War. We know that there's been a number of things that were done to this barn before we started working on it. So our job was to take care of making sure we understood what was historic and what wasn't. Uh, what you're looking at here is a really good example of what happens when a barn lives for 150 years or more. And that's that the farming technologies change the barn remains what it was as much as it can. And so here we have round bales being placed in this barn that was built in probably the, well, for sure, in the first half of the 19th century, the early 1800s. 
obviously there was no such thing as a round bale then. It was meant to be storing loose hay, which was a lot, had a lot less weight to it than this. And part of the problem is when you start adding these types of hay bales into a historic barn, not only does it put huge amounts of load on the floor, but it can do damage to other types of the part of the parts of the barn too, that you don't even realize are happening. Here's a view of the four bay side of the barn. The barn is called a Pennsylvania four bay. Um, I don't know if you noticed in the original slide of it, I'm gonna jump back just so you can see. Notice how the ridge of the barn up here where the light is, that's the ridge of the roof, is centered over the floor of the barn, not centered over the foundation. The foundation ends here. From here to here is the foundation. But the ridge of the roof centers over the floor of the barn. And that means that this part of the barn overhangs and that's the forebay of the barn. So a barn like this is called a Pennsylvania Standard. Uh, Bob Ensminger uh, wrote the book on these types of barns. And this is what's known as a Pennsylvania Standard barn. So when you start putting these types of hay bales into historic barns like this, it's gonna do things to them. That's the four bay view from be at behind the four bay. You can see the overhang in this view. But when you get underneath and you start to look at it, you realize something doesn't appear to be right. And if we see right here, we have this great big bulge in it, okay? And that's primarily the reason that um, Lori and David decided to get a hold of us and, and talk to us about what can we do to fix this? Because there's obviously a problem. When we come up close, we see here that the sill plate of the four bay, which is supposed to be sitting over here on top of these beams, has been pushed completely off the back of the barn by the hay bales. So that's, that's a problem that didn't exist when all you were doing is throwing hay with a pitchfork. I don't think very, the biggest guy that I know, even as big as Caleb, probably couldn't throw a pitchfork of hay at the four bay wall of a barn and push it off the back of the barn. And here we have it happening because now somebody with a skid steer with a spear on the front of it can take that bale in, stick it in the barn, take another bale in, push it against the first one and not realize that the one that was put in in the first place was pushing the back of the barn right off from the timber frame. So once we saw that, we decided probably what we need to do is look around and see, is there any place else that this barn has suffered from um, obviously deferred maintenance, which means not being taken care of very well and water coming in. Um, David's family, the, the barn actually was sold out of the Snyder family in the late 19th century. And it was purchased by um, David Sondland's family uh, around 1954. So in between 1954 and when the Snyders sold it, my opinion is that the people who owned it didn't do a very good job of taking care of it. They neglected it. And so what happened is a lot of water got in and a lot of damage got done. And when You're on mute. You're on mute, Rudy. Okay. There you go. I don't know why that happened. Am I good? Okay. Um, when David's family bought it, um, they decided that they needed to do something about the fact that it hadn't been taken care of very well. And so they did the work that was done in putting new siding on it, uh, putting rolling doors instead of hinge doors. You'll see a picture of that later. Um, putting a roof on it, doing a lot of things that it needed very badly. But they bought it in 1954, which means when they were working on this barn, probably in the 60s, they really didn't have any idea what historic preservation was or proper preservation practice, proper conservation practice. No one even heard of it. 1966 was when the Historic Preservation Act was passed. So then they were doing fixing up the barn and they were taking care of it as best they could. They put tongue and groove pine siding on it. You can see the gaps in between it now from it shrinking, um, but water was let in. I think the roof was let go for far too long. Here you can see pieces of hay hanging out from under this beam, which means they're coming out from inside of this beam, which means it's hollow. Here you can see this brace has come out but there's no tenon on it. 
which means the tenon rotted off. So water was coming in and damage was being done to this barn. And David's family knew you had to do something. Even they then understood that they were the stewards of this barn. Whereas obviously some of the people before them didn't realize that it was up to them to take care of it. I think a lot of people think that historic barns can kind of take care of themselves. I ask kids when I'm doing presentations to um, elementary school kids, I ask them, did you brush your teeth this morning? And they, of course, say, well, of course I did. Then I ask them, do you think that your barn brushed their, its teeth this morning? And they're like, what are you talking about? You know, and it's like, well, the thing you have to realize is that you have to brush the barn's teeth because it can't do it itself. You have to take care of historic buildings. They cannot do it themselves. Well, Lori and David and David's family obviously um, realized that as stewards of this barn, it was their job to do something about the damage had been caused by people who hadn't realized that and didn't take care of it. On the other end of the barn, we find here's a tie beam again. And you can see this great big hole where water obviously had come in through the roof, hit this beam that's called a pearl in here, ran down this beam that's called a pearl in post, went right into this beam, it's called a tie beam, and began to rot it out so badly that it actually created a hole right through the bottom of it. So Caleb, why don't you tell us a little bit about the picture we're looking at here? <laughs> um, David, uh, I, he's a veterinarian, but uh, he, it's interesting. He, every day we show up there in the mornings and he's out there playing in the barn. He goes to work about 11 o'clock. He spends the first couple hours of his day every day taking care of the hundreds of chickens and few turkeys that reside in the basement of this barn. Um, on any given day, they, the chickens could be quiet and nice. Other days, there was cacophony of chaos um, um, ringing, ringing in our ears as we worked or hammered or, or banged on things. Um, you always had to look out for where they were laying their eggs um, or where, where you would find one roosting when you pick something up. So the, as, as the season went on, uh, more turkeys, as in the, the right side of the picture here, uh, began showing themselves. And we did our best to uh, put good surfaces down so that way when we would show up the next morning, there were not remnants of turkey left um, on the night's fresh uh, material or our tools. <laughs> so that was one of the surprises that we found when working on the barn. Is it the first time you've ever worked on a barn where this was the case? Absolutely. There's yeah. chickens here and there, never hundreds, never turkeys. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, and especially not chickens like this. David is a, a specialist in um, um, exotic breeds of, of chickens. Pardon? Yeah. Heritage. Yeah, heritage, heritage breeds of turkeys and chickens. And so what you're looking at is um, the kind of chickens that would have existed when this barn was built. And so these kind of chickens got to exist in it again. <clears throat> um, so what are we looking at here, Caleb? All right, so we, when we removed the floor on, the, on Bay 2 and Bay 3, uh, realize that at some point in the uh, ownership of David's family, they had they realized that uh, the roof leak had caused a lot of damage and, and rot, and they replaced uh, sections of floor joists from uh, the center center of the barn, um, joist, uh, joist skirt C, going back towards the bank in certain sections. Um, and so one of the things we began to do is, is parcel out what, what could be what could be used in whole, what sections could be used in in partial repairs, and then whatever was left, we ended up using new, uh, like uh, similar size material um, to replace the ends, um, to, to tie it all together. So that way we had a continuous floor joist from the, the four base sill all the way forward to the bank of the barn. But in reality, it looks to me like there was a lot of damage that they didn't actually fix. They just kind of propped things up. This beam yeah. right here, I'm pretty sure it was just something they stuck in underneath those joists to hold it up. Because this was, beam we, behind it couldn't hold it up anymore. We, if you notice, there's a, a chicken coop underneath it. And 
as as we started getting down in there, um, the we we realized that the chicken coop was helping support that. So we we removed things. Turns out that beam, along with the original beam, were free floating basically, and and that nice little chicken coop made from made from an old corn crib uh, white oak was really supporting the center of the barn that they've been driving skid steers on and loading with ground sure. So what you're saying is that you don't recommend using chicken coops to hold up historic barns? Uh, <laughs> I would not. <laughs> you're grateful it was there. Yeah, probably a good thing it was there, though. Absolutely. So here we can see all those floor joists have been taken out now. And then here's another discovery over here on the left-hand side of the photograph. We see the beam that supports the barn itself. That's a sleeper. It's the beam that's underneath these major posts that hold the whole way to the roof up and the whole way to the bar above. And here the front of it had rotted off completely. And rather than fix it when the work was done, they just build up a little box beam out of modern two by lumber and tacked it in here to hold it up. So you have this added beam to support things here. No, actually it was back here. This whole summer beam, that's what these beams are called that hold up the joists, was so badly rotted it just had to be removed before the work can continue. And so here you see shoring stacks actually holding up the barn while the work is being done. This was interesting to me. Question, uh, Caleb, would this have been the bent four sleeper? Uh, no, that was Joyce Gert uh, C on bent five. Really? Yeah, the, the bent sleeper five is set on top or within that dovetail. So that's that's the gable end that we saw in the original picture. Okay, so this is this is so this is actually a summer beam then we're looking at. Okay, all right, I misinterpreted it. So, but it's interesting that we see this dovetail joinery being used to connect this barn together. And this is not terribly common in historic barns, but in this case. This, this builder, probably Reuben Snyder, had chosen to use this dovetail uh, to, su <clears throat> to support it. But you can see there's a lot of things that have changed over the years. This beam here, which is supposed to be a brace, isn't even in the mortise. It was probably something else going on here before. So a lot of things have changed over time. Can you tell them about this little surprise we found? Well, if, you, if you want to go back, well, yeah. when, when we had to remove a large section of that bent sleeper uh, to, to replace and then scarf in, we had no idea that that was there. So as we, we picked up the bent above it, just you know a, a quarter of an inch, just enough to be able to slide the pieces out and nothing was moving. We, we had no idea why. We thought it was just housed and sitting on there. Well, we kept going up and up and then as soon as we got a section out, that's when we found that dovetail and that dovetail was on all four um, members that it sat on, which then we had to regroup and readjust so that we could get the rest of the material out because of the dovetail that, that as bad as the, the, the timber was above it, it was still locked in solid by the dovetail. Right. Excellent. That's, that's, some, that's, that's something you don't find every day. So they tell them about this. It, I, the, the picture's taken directly from the bank, right where the door is open. That's the first uh, joy skirt that the, the, the floor joist would sit on. And if you notice underneath the pry bars, there's a half a scarf joint. Well, in, in, the, in the round of repairs that was done, you know, after David's family took over, it, it seems as though instead of replacing wood, they did, uh, I think what we call a concrete half lap or a concrete scarf repair. They, they boxed in the sides of the scarf, poured some concrete, and the, it, if, if you look in the middle, the original peg that went through the scarf joint was in the concrete, and which took forever to get up and out because we had, we had no idea. And without, it, it took us vacuuming off that timber before we realized that was actually concrete that was sitting there. <laughs> yep, like I said earlier, we had to look for the things that were original and the things that we weren't. So clearly the things that we discovered after we started taking things apart were things like this um, summer beam totally hollowed out. You notice the outside of the beam looks good, looks just fine. The inside is totally gone. And this is something a lot of people don't realize when you look at historic barns and you think, well, it looks great. Well, the problem is timbers rot from the inside out. 
because the water gets into the timber. And when it saturates the timber, the outside dries first, the inside stays wet. So the inside rots before the outside does. And there's a very good picture that shows you that timbers rot from the inside out. So here that beam is replaced. Um, here's one of Caleb's crew um, who's underneath looking at the work that they did. Here's that summer beam with replacement had to come in underneath this bent sleeper right here, coming on top of this post because they didn't want to lift the whole barn up, which would have been very difficult and complicated. Rather than that, they put everything together without having tenon. So there's no tenon on top of this post. But if you look here, there's a free tenon that was driven down through all three of these pieces that locks everything together. And that is a very traditional way of doing things. Um, we also see there's new foundation piers. Uh, I believe, Caleb, there weren't any, right? There was, we found a couple pieces of sandstone in the vicinity and it's six inches below all the muck. It turns out there was about two inches of concrete and David told us his brother had poured that when he wanted to raise hogs in the, in the late 60s, early 70s. And we started tapping on it and there was cavities all underneath it. So we, we ended up busting it out and and had to actually cut through the little pieces of sandstone that were um, yeah, consumed when they, they poured the concrete floor. So you can see here's the new concrete underneath and then here's the sacrifice block. And then on top of it is a piece of EPDM, which is a rubber roof membrane to keep moisture from traveling up through into the bottom of the post. Now we're upstairs, one level up. Here's the beam back here that we were just looking at that's been repaired. And now here's the whole bent sleeper being replaced because it was bad all the way from here to the front of the barn, completely rotted out on the inside. And so you can see where um, the crew replaced that bent sleeper and replaced the bottom of this post because the rot had gone up into the bottom of the post too. And many of these braces had been taken out over time. And we chose to put all of those back in. This particular joint um, is known as a uh, let me just hear it. It's a plumbed table bladed scarf. Well, here's the table of the scarf. Here's the blades of the scarf. And the table is plumb on it. And so basically what happened is the bad wood was taken away. And then this new wood was scarfed in in a manner that won't allow this connection to move in the future. So um, it's not exactly original, but it is going to act like original. Um, and you notice that they did use um, historic timber when this was done, so it isn't going to shrink and cause problems. Um, moving along, we find that the joint that we were just talking about, uh, where the dovetail was one, one of these timbers here, um, is the bent sleeper, the beam underneath the bent for bent five, and none of this damage could be seen until the siding was taken off. And then the realization came that the chickens had been hollowing out this beam for God knows how many years. So, <laughs> but um, something had to be done to repair that before the work can continue. And here the beam is after it's been repaired. Um, um, we use two different sections of historic timber to replace the bad part of it. Um, well, here are, there's three scarf joints you can see. There's one here, one here, and one here. Here's the first one on the left. Sorry, it's a little fuzzy. That was a long range shot that we had to focus in on. But this particular uh, scarf joint is called a stepped and wedged level tabled scarf with under squinted abutments. So you can see the table of the scarf joint is stepped. Here's the wedges. And this is called under squinting where you cut the abutments in at an angle so that they lock in from upward movement. And so, by being able to, by doing this, since this couldn't move, this couldn't move, this piece could be slid into it and locked together with the wedge. So it was a, an in situ repair that was done there. This one, here we see the second one, that one is referred to as an edge halved scarf with bridled abutments. And the picture that you see, the drawing that you see, actually shows a face halved scarf which means it's cut into the face of the timber. So this orientation of that joint would have had the cut made here. But the one that we're looking at is rotated 90 degrees. So that's 
cut edgeways through the beam. And the last one here is the um, stop plate uh, splayed scarf with square abutments. And that's here. And the reason that we chose to use that joint is this timber that goes out over the floor bay was still in very good condition. So by using this joint, we could just replace the upper part that was in trouble where the scarf is. You can see the open mortise where the free tenon has not been put in yet, but allow this joint to have plenty of strength yet and be this compression here would hold everything in place so that the four bay part of the beam would still be placed. So once everything was done, if you really looked, all you could see was this little tiny bit of the scarf joint repair, but everything else outside on the four bay was still the original. So here it is now in that previous picture, it wasn't quite finished, but here it is finished. All of the down bracing has been put in place. The bent is open, the repair is done up here. It's ready for siding. And in this picture, you can see the siding is put on. And I'm assuming Caleb that the white flashing will turn red when the next paint job happens. It absolutely will. Yep. <laughs> well, here we are in the front of the barn and we're looking at the barn doors. This is the ramp up to the, um, entry to the, the, the drive bay, drive bays, double drive bays of the barn. And you can see that they're sliding doors. Here the siding has already been replaced. And these uh, sliding doors on tracks are not original. There was no such thing when this barn was built. This barn would have had hinged doors on pinnel hinges. And Lori and deci David decided that let's go ahead and replace those back to what they were with hinged doors again. And so we have a little kind of a fun thing for you to see here. I actually was given a set of um, hinged doors by, by a farmer who replaced the doors on his barn with overhead doors. And um, before I took them apart and put them into storage for my own barn, I took the time to draw them. So I sent this to Caleb and he used it basically as to pattern the doors for Lori and David's barn. And I'm gonna put this on and if you wanna talk about it, Caleb, feel free. Yeah, so we, um, in building the doors, we, we use that that drawing as a template. Um, we use all white oak six by six vertical posts with uh, four by six members uh, running uh, rails running horizontally um, and housed in that diagonal member. Um, these doors weighed roughly 500 pounds a piece. Uh, it, yeah, those forks are from the telehandler setting them in. Um, the uh, we we use the original pin pinnel and strap hinge here. We did not use the. Uh, you want to pause that for a second, Rudy? Um, we we didn't use the 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 pinnel hinges that thread into the wood. We use ones with uh, American standard threads with nut and bolt on either side. Rudy, can you hit pause? Rudy, hit pause. What's that? Hit pause. Oh yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It's all right. There we go. Um, we we used. Uh, Pinnels with with nut uh, nuts on them, so we could adjust uh, the 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 plumb and level of the door a little easier. It, when you're hanging doors on uh, hand hewn and original timbers, those things aren't plumb or straight. It, one one of them was only about an inch out top to bottom. The other one was about three inches out from top to bottom. So th this way, we we were able to hang the door and then. Put our level on and and use the the, the two nuts along the pintel shaft to to adjust them to to the best spot possible regardless of the shape that the uh the post was in we you can buy uh uh pintle hinges at, at a lot of different stores but with the weight of these uh doors we we took the longest ones we could get locally which was uh, uh 14 inches and we cut them and welded a 12 inch uh, extension within them to give a, a little longer coverage of the material uh, just, just to support the weight. Um, so in, in once those were up, we go to side, put, there's one man door going on as, as was typical with the, these style of doors. Uh, we, what you see right here is, uh, a, a, uh, a young artist who started working for us recently and got into carving real quickly, put her paintbrush down instead. And uh, we used the last name of, of the family that owns the Sondlands to put on, on that slide lock, just as a, a nice little embellishment and, and a show of respect to them and the, 
the, the, the work that they have uh, committed to in this barn. Now, if you see the lock on these doors, that's, that's a sapling that came from the property there. Uh, David had told me when, when we were getting ready to do these doors that when he was a kid, there was a long sapling on there, which was quite common with those doors that he loved opening those doors when he was a kid. Can we do that again? So absolutely. So we went out to the front of the drive and cut down some saplings and we use those as the locking mechanism. So the, the, in this view, the right door closes first and the left door has an overlap in the siding, which pinches the right door. And then this sapling grabs a tapered block above it. And once it comes down, it holds it in place. So the, the, both of these sets of doors only open and close from the inside whereas sliding doors, you work from the outside. But the way to access that is that little man door with your slide lock. And it's something they will use every day and, and it, everything works as smooth as can be on there. So again, what we're talking about here is the fact that when Lori and David asked us to work on this barn, they asked us not just to fix things as cheaply as we could, so that the barn wouldn't just completely fall down. They asked us to see what we could do to try and bring back some of the history of the barn. Some of the work that was done by the original builders, some of the intentions of the people that had the barn built, some of the history that was the human input into the construction of buildings that were meant to last for generations. And this is, this is the important thing in my mind, and I think Caleb agrees with me, that um, we need to factor in when we're looking at historic buildings and how to take care of them. The people who built them in the first place obviously did not intend to, for them to last for 15 or 20 or 30 years, the way things too often are built today. They were meant to last for future generations. And so our responsibility in taking care of these buildings is not just to make sure that they're going to be suitably fixed up to last for the generation of people that's paying us, but to last for the generations of people that come after them. David and Lori understood this and they asked us, can you help us do this? We want to hand this on to our children and our grandchildren and their children, knowing that we've done our best to take care of it. Here's a picture of the barn with the doors hung in place after it's done. Um, there still needs to be some piers put in to lock the doors too when they're open, but um, winter came, best not to pour concrete in the middle of winter. Um, the references that we showed you during this um, came from this book, the pictures, the drawings that we showed you came from this book, Historic American Timber Joinery. Um, I use it as a reference, Caleb uses it as a reference. You can buy it on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see the uh, web address where you can go in and find this book. Um, if you're interested in learning more about how these barns were built to last for generations, um, a lot of good information is in this book. Um, I just found out today that I have to buy another copy of it. Oh, too bad, because mine was published in 2002 and the newest one was published in 2014. It's got a whole lot in it that mine doesn't, so I'll have to buy a new one. Um, but I love the book. Um, I highly recommend it for anybody that um, is just a barn admirer, let alone someone who wants to be a good barn steward. Here's pictures from the inside. Very descriptive, really helps. Here's that scarf joint that we were talking about right in the middle of bent five sleeper. Um, so it's, 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 it's a useful book. Um, and before we open this up to questions, uh, Caleb, do you have anything you wanna add before we jump over to questions? I think on the spirit that David, David and Lori have committed to, to, to having done here and, and yeah, no, good. Okay, Sarah. Well, thank you, gentlemen. A great presentation um, and really just a great story of restoration that you were able to share with us. Uh, we can open it up now for questions. And again, we'd like you to use the chat function for that. We will, right at the end, give an opportunity for you to unmute 
um, if you're unable to use the chat function for some reason, but if you could just go ahead and put the questions in the chat box and then I will field them um, for our speakers. So Rudy and Caleb, uh, first question came early on in the presentation and I do wanna just kind of put this caveat out there. I know that we have various um, levels of knowledge among us tonight. So some of you may be members of the Timber Framers Guild. Um, others may just have a very cursory uh, level of knowledge about old barns, or you just have an interest in the way they look. So um, which, whichever happens to be the case, we encourage you to ask your questions, um, whether they be basic or not. Uh, in fact, I'm sure some of you will try to challenge Rudy and Caleb with your questions. So the first question, uh, kind of a simple question, but may not be a simple answer. How do you know if you have a historic barn? The, uh, the standard for historic classification is if it's 50 years old or older. Um, that unfortunately doesn't really apply. I don't, personally, I don't believe in the case of um, timber frame barns, um, because there are a lot of barns that were built afterwards that are not timber frame. A lot of stick frame barns were built and those, many of them are historic now. Um, they evolved into buildings that are built with pressure treated poles that go down in the ground pole buildings. Some people call them pole barns. I always cringe when I hear that because I know they're not barns. Um, but the, the, the standard classification is 50 years old or older, um, and it's classified as historic. Um, I prefer to think of it as being <clears throat> built in the traditional manner rather than built in the modern style. Um, so sloppy answer. Caleb, maybe you have another one. No, I, if, if there's joinery used and and it is tim, it is traditionally timber framed, then it's historic. Anything past that, it's just a stick building. Okay, next question, gentlemen. What roofing material was used, and what siding material was used? This, you didn't replace the roofing. We didn't replace the roofing on this barn. It was already there. And it was a uh, standing seam roof, um, mm -hmm. which I highly recommend, by the way, for historic barns. It's, it's a 20th century material from very, very early in the 20th century, but I, I think it's probably the best choice. Most of these barns, including the one that we just talked about tonight, were built when wood shakes were the standard roofing material. And it's why we have lost a lot of barns because wood shakes just don't hold up in Ohio. They get in trouble pretty fast. Um, but uh, standing seam metal is light um, and it's durable. Um, today, it's actually become much less expensive in the last two decades. And um, David asked that the siding go back to something that was like it was originally, which would have been board and batten siding. Um, we don't know. Caleb, did you find any historic siding when you took off the siding? No, it was all been replaced at one point. Yeah, with that pine tongue and grooved. Yeah, what was used in the 1960s when they did this work or maybe early 70s um, was a pine tongue and groove double V pattern, which is standard for that time. Um, my opinion is it was more likely a poplar, tulip poplar siding that was used originally on it it might have been white oak, but probably tulip poplar. And when it was used as originally, that tulip poplar tree would have been 24, 30 inches or more in diameter. And the sapwood, you could have gotten 12 inch boards and wider out of it with no, with all heartwood, no sapwood, because the sapwood was so thin on it. Today, that's not true. All those trees don't grow the same way anymore. So we chose to use Eastern white pine, um, it holds paint well. It's available with very little sapwood on it, um, and it's a, it's it's in my opinion the most durable material you're going to be able to get, um, realistically within some kind of a rational budget. Um, so eastern white pine for the siding. The, to go back to the roof, the, the one of the most important reasons we always recommend standing seam roof is there's no surface fasteners. Any, any metal roof that has a surface fastener, you're puncturing a hole in the roof membrane. And whether it's in one year, five years, or in 15 years, it's gonna leak. The standing seam roofs, I, I, outside of a tornado throwing things 
through the surface, it's not going to leak. And so that's that that's that's one of the greatest things about a standing seam roof. You pay more for it up front, but you never have to replace it. And they have lifetime guarantees or warranties. Okay, thank you guys. Um, Rudy, can you uh, repeat the name of the book again and the author where it can where they can get it? Um, it's over on the table. Can you grab that for me, Laura? They can get it at TF Guild, Timber Framers Guild, tfguild.org, and this is Historic American Timber Joinery. And it's written by Jack Sobin, but it was underwritten, funded by the Timber Framers Guild when this was written. Um, and what you're looking at is the 2002 copy, which I just realized today is incomplete. So I'm gonna buy another copy, so I'll have two copies of it. But great, great book. Great, thank you. And then uh, someone else wants you to repeat the name of the waterproofing membrane that you mentioned. Um, EPDM, and I have no idea what those words stand for. Um, I probably should, but it's a uh, rubberized roofing membrane, most commonly used um, as ice and water shield, which you put along the lower edge of a roof when you're putting new roofing on so that when water tries to creep back up out of the gutters, when ice has accumulated there, it keeps it from getting into the building. Um, it's, it's, and it's self-sealing. When you attach it with nails, the nails seal um, when they go through, so water can't get through. So it's a rubberized roof mem membrane and it's called EPDM. Um, and, and I guess I need to learn what that stands for, although it's probably long words nobody wants to hear anyways. Thanks, Rudy. Next question. What were the various species of wood that were used in the barn? Caleb, you put it there. The, uh, the only species we found in all of the original timbers and floor joists is white oak. Um, not, obviously not knowing what siding was there, whether it was poplar or white oak originally or heart pine, everything we found was all white oak. And what you put in? What we put in was all either white oak from uh, time, period, time period specific or it was new white oak uh, sawn to dimension. And the reason that we use white oak is it's one of the most rot resistant species of Ohio trees um, that exists. Um, and part of the reason for it, I won't get too far into this, but um, it isn't just oak that you want to use when you're working a barn on a barn. You want to use white oak if you're using it to build the timbers in the barn. And the reason for that is the cells within the white oak tree are filled up with crystallized sugars, which plugs up the cells as they go from being the sapwood, which is the part of the tree that's conducting water back and forth to the leaves into the heartwood, which is basically the structural part of the tree that holds it up. That gets hardening of the arteries. The cells get filled up with tyloses, which keeps water from capillating through them. So it doesn't conduct water. So it really makes it very, very waterproof. Um, so white oak, the only, the only thing you need to be careful of when you're specifying white oak for any of this kind of work is you want to make sure that the Sawyer understands it has to be sap wood free. And that's that layer of wood we were just talking about under the bark that conducts the water. And you can see it, a fresh white oak tree, the wood, the heartwood will be kind of a gray color, but the sap wood will be a bright white or ivory color. You won't, don't want that to be in the finished timber. And the reason is the sap wood is as poor as being rot resistant as the heartwood as being good at rot resistance. The sapwood will literally rot and fall off if left in an outdoor condition in two years or three years. It's really not rot resistant. So sapwood free white oak is what you wanna be working with. Mm -hmm. Great information. Next question, what is your opinion of dismantling and salvaging timber frame from a historic barn in bad condition? Is it sacrilege, is it smart? Is there a case that this is a traditional practice? 
Go, Caleb. All right. There comes a point in every structure where there, where whether you love it or not, it's past the point of being able to do anything. Um, that let's let let's 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 use common sense in that regard. It's it, it, you can repair, you can restore it, but if it's going to cost you so much money and so much has to be repaired, you do what you have to do. Now you we see a lot here in Ohio of. Uh, small whether ground barns or carriage style barns, or even even timber frame barns built in the early 20th century that have members of it that came from barns well uh, before that barn. So barns have been cannibalized in this area in the in the 19th century and used to build newer barns, timber frames still in the early 20th century. So it. it Knocking things down just to make room for them, you know, you, you, you have to sleep with your own conscience at night and that's up to you. But use, use your common sense when it comes to this. It's, it's, it's not idealism or not. It's, it's what's right and what's wrong for you and the structure and how it can be used and all those things. There you go, done. That, that said, I think what's also important to realize is that um, for the most part, the virgin forest in Ohio is gone. There's a couple of places where you can go and you can walk into it and you can see the virgin forest. But the most common place that you can see the virgin forest in Ohio is walk into a 19th century barn and you're looking at the virgin forest. And what that means is that you're looking at timbers that were made from trees that don't grow anymore. The, the wood in those trees was completely different than the wood that we can harvest today to work with. So if you are going to take down a historic barn and not rebuild it. And you have to realize any historic barn can be rebuilt. It doesn't matter how bad a condition it's in, just depends on how deep your pockets are. But if you're gonna take it down for the materials, have respect for the fact that that's material that you can no longer get today. So it shouldn't just be sawn up into floorboards for pretty people on the West Coast, in my opinion. <laughs> Okay, next question. Did, did anyone dendro the barn? Important for future generations to know who did these repairs and when did you sign and date the barn? We have attempted to have that done. Um, a person that used to be one of our employees actually works for the uh, College of Worcester in the wood science department um, and does dendrochronology work, um, Nick Wiesenberg, and it's on his list, but his list has grown so long um, one of the things that's happened during this um, pandemic is a lot of people are stuck at home now. And even though they're trying to turn their bedrooms or their bathrooms or their closets or anything else into a home office, a lot of them end up looking out the window a lot more than they used to. And they realize, oh, look, there's a barn out there. <laughs> I never really thought about that building anymore. Maybe I should be doing something with it or about it. And a lot of them have been trying to figure out how old it is. So the demand for Nick and doing his dendrochronology work has just gone through the roof. It's also so, COVID. pardon? It's also COVID. The labs are closed. Yeah, and, and of course the laboratories are closed right now, so it's harder for him to get the results. But it's on the list, but no, it has not been dendroed. So, um, and he's proven me wrong before, but uh, I'm, I'm gonna put 25 cents on the fact that this barn was built well before the Civil War. No, it has not been signed by any of us, and no, it will not be. Uh, the sliding door lock that we built has the name of the owners on it, and they are far more important than any of us that have worked on it, in, in, in my opinion. Their, their name is what's on that slide lock, and my hope is that 100 years from now, that name will still be there, and that's the name that's remembered, not ours. So there's, there is no dating or signing by any of us on it. One, one question though, Caleb, of, of the buildings that are unlike this, like everything you see being built when you drive down the road today, how many of those do you think are going to be here in 100 years for somebody to appreciate? <laughs> well, if we, ask, if we ask Doug Reed, we got 27 years. <laughs> yeah. Right. So. Next question, guys. Did you work on the Stone Foundation? No. Well, actually, Caleb, did you do any work on the foundation? I, I, I did not know if you did. Uh, nothing on the bank foundation, just, just the piers or pilasters underneath some of the internal posts. 
uh, or interior post, but but nothing on the on the on the principal perimeter foundation. No. Okay, uh, we have a few people that answered um, your question, I guess, Rudy, about EPDM. It stands for ethylene propylene DN monomer rubber. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't say that. <laughs> Fortunately, we have Google. Um, next question, how do you determine the age of a barn? So maybe talk just a little bit more about dendro, I suppose, and some of the techniques you use. Well, I, I, first of all, dendrochronology itself is a relatively recent science in which you can drill small core samples of a tree trying to hit the pith line or the center of the tree uh, when you drill them so you can count the growth rings. And then if you study the growth rings under a microscope, you realize there's a lot of variations between them. And those variations are caused by changes in climate, um, fires, um, various things. And, but what that does is it allows you to establish a pattern, which when compared to other known samples of known age, you can then match up your sample and try and figure out the age of it. But there's other ways too that you can date a historic barn, um, which are much more commonly what I use because I don't do dendrochronology myself um, and Nick's too busy. Um, but one of the things that I look for very commonly is um, something that Caleb mentioned and that's um, species consistency. Is the barn built of the, what the builder would have preferred to use? So if you find a barn that is all white oak, there's a pretty good chance that the builder was working out of the virgin forest and he could go out and he could select those prime white oak trees that he wanted to work with to build the barn. So that's one of the first things that I look for. Um, those forests were badly harvested. I mean, very seriously harvested um, by the second half of the 19th century. Um, by the middle of the second half of the 19th century, large stands of virgin forest were very uncommon. So when you find a barn that is all white oak, which is what Caleb said, that's all he found, that's all I found too, um, then you can probably guess that it's an early barn. Uh, the other thing that I like to look at is the way that the barn was converted. And what that means is from turning the logs into timbers. You cut the tree down first, but then you have to make the log into something you can work with. If you're building a log building, it's already there. But if you're gonna build a timber frame, you probably want those buildings to either be hewn on four sides, or in the case of floor joists or rafters, maybe only hewn on two sides. So you look at how it's converted. Um, if it's all converted by either an ax or a fro, which means riving, then you're probably looking at a building that was built before any sawmills were within reach of the builder's building site. Um, so that's gonna put it in most cases in Ohio, somewhere in the 18 teens to early 1830s. By then there were quite a number of sawmills existing um, in Ohio. But those sawmills used what are called up and down sawmilling techniques, which was a blade mounted in a frame. So it's also known as a sash saw. And those up and down blades, when they ran through the log, would leave parallel scratch marks on the law, on the timber that, that was made that are perpendicular to the edge and they're parallel to one another. So when you find the sash saw marks or the up and down saw marks, you know that that's the type of mill that was used. Well, those mills pretty much came, went out of existence after the Civil War because one of the things that happened during the Civil War was the steam engine was developed. It was developed mainly as a military to, to accelerate military machinery advances in it. But after the Civil War, the portable steam engine was widely available. And so it was marketed to a lot of our different members of our culture, our society. And one of those was sawmills because anybody that mounted a steam engine on their mill, instead of running it on a water wheel, all of a sudden could make a lot more lumber a lot faster. So buildings that were built after the Civil War are gonna have circular sawn rather than up and down sawing, sawing in them. And the last thing we look at is the nails. Um, it's 
almost almost never do you find true square nails, which are hand forged in anything in Ohio. But you do find cut nails, which are nails that were made with a steam a trip hammer <clears throat> cut out of plate. So when you look at them actually in a cross section, look at the end of it, they're actually rectangular because they were made out of flat stock, but then cut with an angle on each side. So they're tapered in one direction and not tapered in the other direction. But in the late 1890s, about 1895, wire nails, which are the nails that we use today, round nails, became available. So we look at the nails, you know, and we say, okay, well, are there any round nails in here? And then we determine were those added later or were they originally put there? And that'll help us decide whether it's um, a 19th century or a 20th century barn. So those, those are basically the techniques that I personally use. Caleb, do you have anything else that you use? Uh, the, the, the only thing I'd add is in between the Civil War and the turn of the century, you, you start to see a combination of hewn and sawn timbers in a barn where, you know, shorter members are sawn, longer members are hewn. The, the, the more members sawn and the less members hewn, the later in the 19th century, you're, you're going to be able to start pinpointing this barn, whereas you know, 1870, late 1860s, you're still seeing a lot of hewn with just a little bit of saw. So that's that's the only other thing I had. Yeah, and even and even later in the 19th century, you still will find hewn timbers where their need is for long ones like tie beams, mm -hmm. Plate. um, top plates, and so you may find everything else sawn in the barn, posts, wall, siding girts, everything else, but the long pieces are still hewn because nobody had a sawmill that was going to saw a 40 foot timber. And they didn't have the wagon that could transport it from the sawmill. So you right. find things that could fit on a wagon and be pulled by a horse. Those those members are sawn still. Down roads that were mud ruts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, I know we have several more questions. And I'm sure we could go most of the night with questions. But why don't we keep it to maybe another 10 minutes with questions? So next question, we have somebody looking for a recommendation. Um, any recommendations on how to prevent damage from woodpeckers on wood siding? Somebody that's gotten a lot of bird damage on several of their historic barns. I'm not an expert on that. Um, and I'm not very good with a shotgun, but- uh, And we have them in our barn. Yeah, and we have them in our barn too. Um, I have been told that mixing cayenne pepper, ground cayenne pepper and water and spraying it on the areas where they're um, Try, trying to get into will deter them. I don't even know if that works because I've never tried it myself. Uh, Caleb, have you heard any other? The, the, the only mantra I know, it, and it refers more to wood boring bees than it does woodpeckers, but it might be the same. If you, if you provide them an easier place to do what they need to do, they'll leave your barn alone. So like with wood boring bees, you hang, you hang uh, uh, like bamboo or, or hunks of wood with holes in it already. So that way they don't have to work as hard to get what they want. The chances are they'll move there instead of the barn. Will it work with woodpeckers? Not sure, but a shotgun looks great too as well. Okay, so shotgun, pepper spray, or more bird feeders. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, Caleb, could you review how you did the free tenon install? Uh, the free tenon install on the on the, the summer beam or joy skirt. We, we aligned where the posts would sit and had our, had our slot mortise on the post in line with the mortise through the scarf joint. So that way, once it was all together, we were able to go through both horizontal members into the vertical member. Um, when it came to vertical, vertical and perpendicular members, uh, there was an equal spacing inside that we were, once things that sat down, we could come, we could drop in and slide over, peg, and then in that slot left over, we would put a filler block down in. So that way that 10, it's not only pegged, but it's also locked in, but allows us to install after the, the members are put where they need to be. And we, uh, we've used a, a slightly different technique where you actually extend the length of the, um, blade joint, um, sorry, the fork joint in the bottom of the post um, 
up the height of the tenon that's going down into what the post is sitting in so that you have room to slide the free tenon into the post and then tap it down into the mortise. And once you have it into the mortise, about as far as you think it's gonna go, drive crossing wedges in above it that finish driving it into place and then peg it into place. So there are two different ways. You can do it horizontally or do it vertically. Next question is from Judy. And Judy, I know you've given us quite a bit of information about your barn here. I would encourage you to maybe email us through the website at friendsofohiobarns.org. Um, and we may be able to see if there's a board member that's close to you or a knowledgeable member that's close to you that might be able to give you some more information about your barn. But the uh, basis of her question, is there a listing of known barn builders documented from over the years uh, around Ohio? None that I know I have, but I would love it if there was one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so again, Judy, I hope that you'll email us. Um, was there spouting installed or was it already there and functional? Okay, it's spouting on the bank eve that ran across on the forebay or the, the 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 rear eve there is not spouting currently but my understanding is there will be very soon below it there's concrete and it's drainage out to the pond which works for the moment it's not ideal it it, it needs to be uh addressed which it, it, my understanding is it will be but on the bank side there is spouting and it does work yes and, and part of the reason I think, Caleb, what, for what you're talking about is the fact that even though in a nice gentle rain, when the water comes off the roof into a gutter and goes out to where you want it to go, that's great. In a heavy rain, it still goes into the gutter and goes where you want to go. But if there's no gutter, it only drops down onto the concrete when it's a nice gentle rain. But if you've got a storm going on, it's going to go wherever it wants to go, including getting blown right up against the siding and then finding its way wherever it wants after that. I agree. In other words, there needs to be gutters on your barn, both events, or no matter what. <laughs> hey, guys, how do you think Ohio is holding up on hardwood for these kinds of repairs? Yeah, I think that is a good question. That's what Laura just said. Um, one of the problems that we have in Ohio is that we haven't come to the same realization that a lot of the West Coast states have, and that's the depletion of our resource. Um, we don't really have any real awareness of how badly we have mismanaged our forests. Um, there are some beautiful woodlots out there. Um, I've worked for people who did an incredible job of managing their woodlots to the point where we actually built their whole house right out of their woods, but they took care of them for 40 years before they even asked us to build a house out of them. Um, it's just not done. Um, so the answer to the question of how well are we doing in having um, the resource available in the future, I don't think anyone knows, but I'm concerned. Hey, we have a gentleman who said that they have chosen metal roofing with neoprene screws for the roof and metal siding with some fasteners. It's not original, but more in their budget and just wanted your comments on that choice. My comment on the metal roof for the um, siding is I don't think it's a very good idea myself. Um, metal roof for the roofing, I think is a good idea if you remove the old roofing. Um, once you've removed the old roofing and you put the new roofing on, you got rid of the problem. Typically when metal siding is put on, it's covering up the problem. And so whatever existed, just like the pictures that you saw from um, Lori and David's barn, um, the siding that was removed on that in vent where you saw the chickens were nesting inside of the beam, those, that damage was not done in the last 50 years or 60 years since the siding that they removed was put on. It was done before the siding was put on. And when they restored it in the 1960s or early 1970s, I think probably the 1960s, um, when, they, when they redid, rehabbed it and put the siding on, they just covered it up, okay? Same thing happens when you're putting metal siding on. Unless you take the old siding off, 
you're not going to discover the problems that exist. So you're just burying the trouble further, la more layers in. So I, I really don't particularly care for metal siding on a barn. Plus it sweats. It's going to add water over the years. That's, and that, that's, that's another big thing is that the, 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 the barn as a whole needs to work as an ecosystem with the humidity and the moisture of the seasons. When you lock that in with metal siding, you, you, you stagnate that. And there's no greater force on earth than hydraulic pressure and water. And if you don't allow it to move in and out, it, it, it has a tendency to cause damage really quickly. Yeah, Jim Askins, who was the founder of the Historic Preservation Training Center, um, in an early lecture that I wish I'd have been able to attend, um, but one of his best students, it's a good friend of mine, told me about it. Um, but he said that the three worst enemies of historic structures were water, water, and water. <laughs> I think that goes to this next question, which I think is an important one for folks who may be joining us who are just starting to inquire about um, the restoration of a historic barn that they have. If you're going to restore a barn and you know the roof is leaking, would you start there before doing anything else? Absolutely not. Unless all you're doing is temporary patching. It's stopping the water from coming in by temporary patching is a really good idea. Mm -hmm. Replacing the roof is a really bad idea because the problems that have been caused within the structure of the barn by water coming in, if they're significant, will require that the roofing or at least the roof itself be removed in certain areas of the barn to do the work. What happens when water comes in through the roof of the barn is it finds the most convenient place to go. So it'll run down the rafters it will find its way to what's called the top plate, which is the beam that the rafters sit on. And typically those rafters are notched into that top plate. So the water comes down the rafter, goes into the notch and eventually starts to rot out. The longer the roof is left to leak, the worse the rotting is. So if you put a new roof on it, sure, you've stopped the water from coming in, but you've made it practically impossible to fix the damage that was done before you put the new roof on. So temporarily putting the, stopping the water. Um, tarping works if you're gonna fix it in a few months. Um, getting up there and putting a sealant on it or a patch is gonna work with it if you're gonna do it for a couple of years. But no, do not replace the roof first. Fix the problems that was, were caused by the water coming in from the previous roof first and then put a new roof on. Caleb? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay. Okay, um, you might be able to answer these relatively quickly. One person wondering approximately when they started using masonry block and another person wondering approximately when they started using rolling track doors instead of hinged doors. The earliest rolling track doors that I have seen, which Caleb actually rebuilt um, the rollers for on a set of doors in this barn, um, the barn was built in 1887, and it had rolling doors that were installed that were actually inside instead of outside. So the doors, the track was hung on the inside of the barn, not on the outside of the barn. Um, and I've seen that on several barns, and I'm pretty sure they're all the same age. So I would, I'm going to just throw a number out there and say um, mid-1880s is when the rolling track um, door came to be. Um, Concrete masonry units um, came out in the very early 1900s. Um, I don't know the exact date, but I would, I would throw a hazard a guess at it and say probably um, 1910 to 1920 um, was when you would see the first concrete masonry units um, that were established. Now, concrete foundations will date back um, as far as 1900, but when you find one of those, it's commonly built by using boards to create the forms so you can see where the boards were when the concrete was poured. And um, some of those are very durable and some of them aren't uh, because the standards for mixing concrete weren't established until 1910. So before that, you had a lot of problems with concrete being mixed with bad components, um, dirt, you know, things that shouldn't have ever been in there. So it can be very weak. So. Um, Caleb, you have any other input on that? 
put those early concrete ones, you'll see them near a creek or, or a watershed area because they would use a lot of the river run or bank run as yeah. fill for it. Now, sometimes those are about as hard as imaginably possible to break apart or adjust because of the amount of bank run that's in it, but they're often right near one of the, a, a watershed area. Okay, I think we're gonna go for one more question. And I know that there are gonna be a few questions that we don't get to tonight. Believe me, I know that these gentlemen are a wealth of knowledge and we probably could go most of the evening trying to pick their brains. So um, last question here, how are broken braces replaced? Broken braces? Yes. Um, brace mortises, if, you, if you're not gonna be able to take anything apart and it's just the brace, and more often, this is because it was cut out. You know, what happens too often in barns that were built in the 19th century is they continue to be used up into the 20th century. But early in the um, 1900s, big farm machinery starts to appear. And you can't get it in the barn because they hit those damn braces. <laughs> and so people would come in and saw them out of the way. Okay, um, <clears throat> What my recommendation for the simplest way to do it and the way that we've done it for years is you extend the mortise that's vertical. So if you have a brace going from a post to a tie beam, let's say, you extend the mortise on the post down. Um, normally we find two inches is enough. And then you make the new brace, slip it in because that allows the tenon on the bottom to swing into place. Once you have it in place, then you drive a two inch by two inch plug in where you took out the two inch extension on the mortise to lock it in place and you're all set to go. Um, you don't want to do it on the tie beam because the horizontal position for that plug will only mean that someday it may just fall out and then the brace isn't going to be any good anymore. But if it's horizontal, it's going to stay where you put it. Caleb? And, and if, if your brace is broken, I mean, yes, so many times it was taken out for equipment, machinery, headroom, whatever. If it's broken, look a little further to see why. Because it takes a lot of lateral movement in one area and for a brace to either break or come out. So it might be that what you see is a break in the brace, but what's really happening is, is somewhere forward or aft of the actual brace location. Like the post has moved, and so it's no longer a 90 degree corner. Yeah, the bank pushing in. And you know the the, the plate staying the same, yeah, the, the multiple, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, you look yeah. Past just what you see. Yeah, so so don't fix the problem of the broken brace until you figure out the problem of why the brace broke. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great, thank you guys. Again, I'm apologize that we can't get to everyone's questions tonight. I want to be conscious of our speakers' time, but I did want to read one comment. From Mindy. She said she really appreciates the information and the speakers and facilitators time. She said, I'm fortunate to have bought a property with a historic barn with lots of deferred maintenance. This lecture has inspired me to start planning repairs and restoration that is long overdue. So Mindy, that's fantastic. That's exactly what we hope to do. And Rudy and Caleb, great job tonight. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, everyone who joined us, we really appreciate your time this evening. Please be thinking about uh, future lectures. Um, we'll have information about those lectures on our Facebook page, as well as on our website. Again, friendsofohiobarns.org. If we didn't get to your question tonight, or if you have a more specific question about your barn, I would encourage you to reach out to us through email, and we'll do what we can to assist you. Again, look forward to future lectures, and we really, really appreciate your attendance this evening. And take care of your barns. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for coming. Good night. Nice to see you all.